The scheme was launched today with a lavish media event, complete with bus ride to the harbour foreshore and the caterers going all out. What's this? Welcome. Oh. Open it up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> My play lunch. <laughs> Newcastle Buses General Manager Len Regan was on hand to welcome the guests and explain just how the service will operate. The, the social groups that are organising their Christmas parties ring us up, tell us uh, where they want us to pick the group up, we'll take them to wherever they're going to have their party and at a nominated time we'll go and pick them up from their party and either take them back to work or if it's the end of the day, we'll take them home uh, you know, to nominated locations like Walls and Belmont, Charles and shopping centres. If they want a taxi from there to get home, we'll book it for them. And it won't be just one bus stretched to the limit, but as many of the organisations all Mercedes fleet as there is demand for. We'll put as many buses on as we get bookings for. So uh, if you've got a large group, we can fit 40 people per bus. So if you've got 120, we'll give you three buses. And it's $160 per bus. So, if you are approached at a Christmas function with an offer like this, take it up, even if it turns out to be not all it seems. <coughs> Excuse me, either of you girls like a lift home? Uh, I've got a Mercedes out the front. Sandra Southern and Sue Latimer just love kids. They must because a pair spend just about every waking hour with dozens of youngsters, some from their own family and most from other families. Sandra operates a child minding and activity centre at the Nine Mile Beach Caravan Park at Redhead. Sue does the same at Fullerton Cove's Bayway Caravan Village. Both offer much needed support to residents of the parks, minding the children, arranging special activities for them and organising endless fundraising functions to ensure the money is there to meet the children's needs. Both are employed through the Van Leer Hunter Caravan Project, though according to the program's directors, both offer services above and beyond the call of duty. As a result, when the NBN Children's Television Advisory Panel decided to offer an award in Children's Week for services to kids in the community, Sue and Sandra were top of the list. And we recognise the tremendous amount of work that Sue and Sandra are putting into their programs, not just once a week, but also on other nights there was a need for children to be doing something. And also in the holidays there was very often not a lot for the kids to do and they were providing activities during the holidays as well. The pair were presented with their awards today by Peter Lewis, chairman of the advisory panel. It's the first time the award has been given out, but according to Judy Geggy, program development officer with the Caravan Project, there will be many more. Yes, this will be an ongoing uh, an award and so some sort of mechanism will be set up to make it open to the greater community as well. The new institution will replace Tamworth's controversial Endeavour House and the work is expected to go to tender this week. Endeavour House, already the scene of four riots and one death this year, hit the headlines again this week. 17-year-old Aboriginal Dermot Pigeon was transferred from there to Maitland's maximum security jail. Three days after the move, he committed suicide. His death has prompted calls for the immediate closure of Endeavour House and a member of the New South Wales Legislative Council has called on the state government to set up an immediate Royal Commission into the deaths of juveniles in both institutions and jails. The scenic Mount Penang site overlooking Gosford currently houses a medium security juvenile centre and in previous years has been used for community activities including a sculpture symposium, the springtime flora festival and equestrian events. Activities like these will continue as normal even when the maximum security institution is up and running in 1991. In the Hunter, teachers met at 17 different venues to vote on Dr Metherill's offer. A group of 600 teachers at Cardiff angrily denounced the package, saying there was no room for negotiations. 
the package is outrageous. Everything's wrong with the package. I was asked a question the other day as to are there any parts in the package with which we could actually agree about which we can negotiate. And the only truthful statement in the package is the date on it. Following the satellite link up with the Sydney meeting, the teachers voted overwhelmingly for two half day strikes on November 2nd and November 16. Speakers also called for additional action pinpointing schools in Dr Metherell's and Mr Griner's electorates. However, it was agreed to settle for the statewide stoppages. The argument over wages comes on top of a dispute involving Year 12 teachers working replacement classes during the HSC. And teachers say they've had enough of Dr Metherell's approach to education. An insult. We've been too soft and we're at war. And it's an attack on children's education and I think or I hope that uh, parents see that and that it is an attack on their children and uh, support us in this. Students treated the teachers' strike like a holiday. With blue skies and predicted warm temperatures, they began flocking to the beaches early. It was obvious that they weren't thinking about school. What do you think of the teachers' strike? I don't know. Not bad to catch up with some surf. What are you going to be doing? I'm um, probably just staying at the beach. Department of Education figures show high absenteeism by both Hunter teachers and students. Less than 10% of teachers attended school and even fewer students turned up. The high absentee levels by the school students, was that to be expected? Well, in light of the fact that parents would have been told what to expect, yes. Shopping malls were packed with school pupils filling in the day. With the threat of a change in the weather early this afternoon, many school students ended up in some rather predictable other teenage spots, like the movies, where business is reported to be at least ten times usual turnover. Students were also making the most of amusement centres. One had its best trading day in months. Willie Lafitte for NBN News. At 3 o'clock this morning, hundreds of people began queuing outside the Civic Theatre box offers. The mainly teenage crowd was given tea and biscuits by the Salvation Army and Radio FM 105 staff. The John Farnham The Whispers Out tour will be held at the International Sports Centre. Organisers are taking no chances with the weather and will be putting up a big top. They say John Farnham's concerts are in such a high demand he can appear only once in the Hunter region and in case of an unexpected rainstorm would be unable to reschedule another concert, disappointing thousands of his fans. The 870 hectares of swamp was accepted by the Minister for the Environment, Tim Moore, at a small ceremony at the adjoining Shortland Wetland Centre. The land was given to Newcastle by the Federal Government in 1963 as a possible site for a regional airport. But proximity to military aircraft operations from Williamtown and a growing awareness of the importance of preserving coastal wetlands meant that never was to be. It creates a major new protected area here in Newcastle. It protects an international bird habitat. It's something that's supported by all the local politicians, Liberal, Labor, National and Independent. And it provides a very significant addition to the national parks areas in and around Newcastle. This diagram shows the scale of the additions to the Wetlands Reserve. The yellow is the present Shortland Centre and now add the green shaded area as far as the old coal railway through the Hexham Swamp, increasing the area 13 times. The Shortland Wetlands Complex itself has been honoured by an award for excellence in rural planning from the Royal Australian Planning Institute. We started off with our own broad plan and then BHP paid for the design and management study and. Uh, our ideas were incorporated into that plan and we 
uh, part of the award was to show how much we'd achieved and we had ticked off virtually every objective that was in that original design and management plan. Disasters overseas have led authorities here to be more mindful of the effects of oil spills on the natural habitat of plants and animals. Plans have already been drawn up for possible spills in Port Jackson and Botany Bay, and the one for Newcastle has been some time in coming. Just like the Hexham Swamp Nature Reserve, there is a major national park nature reserve on Kurigang on the in the northern shores that protects, again, international bird habitat, breeding areas for prawns and fish, all of which is under major threat if there's a significant oil spill in Newcastle Harbour. So what we're releasing is something that assesses what the threats are and provides a blueprint for local authorities, the Maritime Services Board and others to help clean up and prevent damage if an oil spill occurs. The report looks at areas vulnerable in the event of a spill and what can be done to minimise the effects, taking into account bird nesting, mangrove swamps, oyster leases and fishing areas and recreation spots. It plots areas sensitive to oil dispersants and shows where booms would be most effective in minimising the spread. The Atlas, as it's known, covers an area from the northern tip of Fullerton Cove down to Redhead and west as far as Ironbark Creek. The verbal war over long wall mining under residential areas at Bolton Point has been long and bitter. The former Unsworth government ordered an inquiry in a bid to resolve the dispute. In August, the day report, and still uncertainty over the future of long wall mining. While Mr Day rejected BHP's application to long wall mine panels 9 and 10, Energy Minister Neil Pickard said future proposals would be considered on their merits. If they come up with fair proposals that give a balanced development, then we will certainly proceed. In the latest development, the Minister has granted permission to Taralba Collieries to develop six headings or tunnels in the Young Walls End Sea. Residents fear it's the first step towards long wall mining. These headings, as we understand it, are part of the preparation work for long wall mining. However, the Minister says at this stage he hasn't approved long wall mining under the area. We say that's are ridiculous, you wouldn't allow the, the company to invest so much money in driving these tunnels if you weren't going to allow long wall mining at the end of it. Mr Ramsden says residents are in the dark over Taralba Colliery's plans. He says the company has violated the spirit of the day inquiry by not keeping them informed. The day inquiry suggested that there should be a lot more communication with people in the area before they do these sorts of things. There's been no communication from the company to this people to people in this area, even though the company submitted their proposals in May this year. Management at Turalba Colliery confirmed today that preparatory work to Long War Mine Panel 9 has been underway for two to three months. Mine manager Bob Reynolds says permission has not yet been granted for Long Wall extraction, but he's confident it will come. In any event, he says the company has to take a punt if it's to maintain its current workforce. Mr Reynolds says the company hopes to start long wall extraction of Panel 9 mid-1990. It started with 19-year-old Colin Farr, who held off the more experienced George Tatnell to win a nail-biting opener to the night. There's only one left to go from here. Tatnell sees the white flag wave. What will he do this time round? Colin Farr, George Tatnell. Tatnell climbing all over the back of Colin Farr, trying to get by. But I think the youngster's going to hang on. The young fella's going to hold George Tatnell at bay, and that's a damn good drive. Colin Farr first. As usual at the motodrome, there was the odd one or two drivers who preferred to drive on their roofs. But fortunately, neither Joe Madsen or Brad Hayward were injured. The main feature saw the large field of 20 get away to a great start, and it was sensational 18-year-old Brooke Tatnell who stole the show. Getting this, the chequered flag, a great win to Brooke Tatnell. Second place will go to Bob Tunks, just in front of the Queenslander, Nathan McDonnell.
Hunter Valley, New South Wales is a place known in steam admiring circles around the world, mostly thanks to Bayer and Peacock of Birmingham and John Brown of Maitland. Brown bought a team of 14 specially built Bayer and Peacock locomotives early this century to haul coal. Some continued to do that job right up to 1983, when most were shunted into this shed at the South Maitland Railway Depot, where they've been ever since. They're about to see the light of day again under the care of a new owner. I've got a very large collection of railway carriages and um, never a steam locomotive to haul them with, so now I've got seven. The reason the locos are worth so much is because once they're up and running, they can be a virtual licence to print money. Back when they were in working order, up to 20,000 people a year came from all over the world just to watch them. You don't have to be a genius to work out the tourist potential for the new owner. South Maitland Railways gave nine of the metal dinosaurs to the Hunter Valley Training Company on the understanding it would sell those it didn't restore. Company apprentices have rebuilt one and the first of the team will be retained as well. Businessman Chris Richards paid $160,000 for the remaining seven numerous spare parts and several brake cars. Steam locos are collector's items around the world. Milton Morris admits the locos would probably have brought millions overseas, but a heritage order means they must remain in New South Wales and the seven not be broken up. Mr Morris says a quick sale was important as the council needed the shed space and couldn't look after the whole set anyway. If you go to some of the railway preservation societies in New South Wales, you'll see a yard full of rust buckets. I don't want that here. Steam railway enthusiast's biggest fear is that the locos will now leave the valley. Mr Richards does have an interest in a railway museum at Goulburn, but says he wants to keep them here. Mr Richards hopes to buy coal and allied land at Hexham at the end of the old Stockrington line. Coal and Allied, however, says it's already considering several offers for the 80 hectare site, which is prime industrial land flanked as it is by both the highway and the railway. One hundred and eighty sailboarders from twenty-three countries gathered in Corpus Christi, Texas for the premier windsurfing event in the world. All sailors use exactly the same equipment and the rules are the same for these titles as they are for the Olympics. Competing in the lightweight division, Chris finished second overall in the slalom and was named the world champion lightweight sailor. But more was to come as the brilliant board rider stole the show to win the marathon against all comers, but only after some hair-raising moments. Yeah, it was quite difficult on the, uh, the upwind leg because it was uh, a 7 kilometre beat and um, I couldn't see this mark until I was within one kilometre of it so I had no idea where I was going. I was just tacking on top of the whole fleet hoping that it'd, it'd pop up somewhere and um, it eventually did. So I was lucky enough to get around with a pretty good lead and uh, hold it to the finish. By winning the gruelling marathon, another bonus for Chris when he was declared the Mistral Class overall champion. Uh, yeah, I was quite pleased to win it because uh, this is a combined fleet with the heavyweights and the lightweights, so, so we're all racing together and it's the only opportunity we have to do that uh, throughout the regatta, so I was quite pleased to win it, yeah. There is few openers in world cricket that inspire a crowd like the West Indies' Gordon Greenwich. The veteran has battled with the Lilies and Thompsons of this world and on most occasions has come out on top. In Australia for three to four months coaching in the ACT, Greenwich has joined the Tui's team to help with coaching programs throughout the state of New South Wales as well. And he feels that his efforts should be directed at the younger cricketers. Whether it's here in uh, New South Wales in the ACT or in the West Indies, I think it's a vital part of um, all our games and if the younger generation is going to learn the game, the game uh, a lot quicker than we did and uh, they want to play at the level that uh, it is played at the moment. I feel that uh, coaching is, uh, should be a very big part on their agenda. While in Newcastle, Greenwich will also play for Gosford in a day-night match against Newcastle at Townsend Oval tomorrow night. For Steve Small, who will play for Newcastle, the Central Coast team will be a formidable lineup. Players of Gordon Greenwich and Mike Whitney and Mark Waugh and Graham Smith's calibre uh, and then the local players, uh, the Newcastle boys, we're going to have to be on our, uh, on our best merits tomorrow to, uh, to bring the cup back again for the well, 12th time. I think.
trawler operator Barry Albert and novice crewman Trevor Brown were rescued from the ocean by another trawler last night after their boat, the Leanne Joy, struck a submerged object and began taking water. The air all went to the, went to the uh, front of the boat, sunk stern first, and it just exploded. So what did you think at the time? What, what could you do? Yeah. We, we were in the water by that time. Yeah. We were swimming. This morning, Barry Albert has only memories of his $40,000 vessel and memories of last night's ordeal, which strike a sour note. Although he owes his life to a nearby bulk carrier, the Nova Cosmos, which advised nobbies of the sinking, he says the captain could have done more. What I can't understand, they made no attempt to lower a lifeboat. You know, they were standing out in the wings of the bridge, watching the whole procedure. Did, did you feel though that when they were standing there watching that there would be some sort of move to rescue you? Not from the ship. They just made no attempt. The captain of the Nova Cosmos says he did lower a lifeboat. Speaking by radio phone, Captain Paul Goh said the two men floating at sea couldn't have seen the boat, which was lowered immediately. Whatever the case, it's almost certain that if the Nova Cosmos's lookout hadn't seen the men, they would have drifted further south to be lost for good in the gathering darkness. Tom Hilston, NBN News. Jockey Jim Cassidy had the choice of either mount, but after track work yesterday morning, has chosen to ride Interstellar. Interstellar's victory in the recent Geelong Derby trial was outstanding, and he is a strong stayer suited to the long stretches of Flemington. Zamoff is very smart and could not have been more impressive in winning Saturday's Herald Vars at Mooney Valley. Zamoff on the outside, Zamoff on the outside, race to Stargazer, halfway down the straight. Zamoff takes the lead from Stargazer there, well clear of impassable, but Zamoff drawing away for a good win. He won with something in hand, I felt Zamoff about a length to Stargazer. Counterfeit faces a rising class following victories in his past three starts, but he cannot be underestimated. So for the trifecta at Flemington, 6, 2 and 7, Interstellar to beat Zamoff and Counterfeet. For the daily double, try Interstellar in the first leg and Horlicks in the second leg, the McKinnon Stakes. In Sydney, they race at Rose Hill and in the legs of the daily double, try Mount Vesuvius in the first leg, race 6 and in the second leg, race 7, try number 11, High Spy. For your trifecta, the numbers you want to be semaphored are 11, 1 and 6, High Spy from Regal Prize and Eastwood. The doggies strut their stuff at Beaumont Park tomorrow and Calypso Appeal along with Hill Flash should take out the Daily Double while Hill Flash, Boomer Star and Like a Revenge should fill the placings for your trifecta. Trotting returns to Cessnock on Saturday evening and in the legs of the Daily Double try preferably you in the first leg and Namesake in the second leg and for the trifecta at Cessnock 2, 8 and 1, Namesake to beat Blow and Smoke and Strike first. Let's hope the big fella Gary Harley's on the mark once again. <laughs>